So I'm going to talk about the additional considerations for cluster randomised trials in, in um, ROB2. And I just want to start by acknowledging the huge amount of work put into these additional considerations over um, quite a number of years by my co-authors shown here, and also highlight that there's a lot more information um, on the website, um, the ROB2 um, website. So um, as uh, Tian Jing has uh, outlined, there are five domains for the revised risk of bias tool. Um, and starting with probably what's the, the main um, additional consideration for cluster randomized trials is that we've added a sixth domain, domain 1B, which I'm going to spend some time on. And for the rest of the time, I'm going to go through the tool and show where we've added signaling questions because we, could, we have added to a number of domains and explain why with examples. I'm also presuming that um, everyone on the call knows basically what a cluster randomized trial is. But for the benefit of those people who, who maybe um, don't or are, are a bit rusty, it's a trial in which we randomize groups or clusters of participants rather than participants themselves. And those groups of clusters are often pre-existing groups. They're hospitals, um, general practices, uh, schools, villages, et cetera. Um, and as, as for crossover trials, one of the important things about cluster randomized trials is that we do the sample size and analysis correctly. Um, we adjust for the clustering in the trial. Um, and if that hasn't happened within a trial that you're reviewing in, in a systematic review, if they haven't done a correct analysis, then the likelihood is that, that if that um, if you don't do something about that when you're putting your trial into a meta-analysis, then the trial will carry more weight than it really should do in the meta-analysis. But I'm not going to say much more about cluster randomized trials themselves. I just want to go through the five domains. So starting with domain 1A, um, these are the signaling questions for domain 1A. And there are no changes to these questions. But I just want to say a little bit about um, question 1.3 for this domain, baseline imbalances suggesting that there might be a problem um, with the randomization process. So um, there are several things to sort of emphasize um, when using this, uh, this question. And one is that because the randomization in a cluster randomized trial is done at cluster level, then the focus should really be on looking at imbalance in cluster level characteristics. Um, however, if you do that, many cluster randomized trials have a relatively small number of clusters included, and it's therefore more likely that you will get uh, chance imbalances than you would do in individually randomized trials. On the other hand, um, it's much harder to predict how clusters will respond and partly because of this and partly because of the way that randomization is done in most cluster randomized trials, it's probably less easy to subvert the randomization. So though we might see imbalances more often, um, the chances are that um, they, are, they are probably chance imbalances. Um, lastly, there is another possible reason for um, some types of imbalance and that's what domain 1b is about and I will come back to that but before I do that I just wanted to introduce to you this study the opera trial that I'm going to use throughout the session as an example this was conducted in 78 residential care homes for older people in the UK the intervention in this trial was multifaceted and designed to increase phys the physical activity of res residents and thereby reduce depression so the trial had an uneven randomization ratio. Um, and so we didn't expect equal numbers in the intervention and control group. We expected a larger number of clusters in the control group than in the intervention group. Um, but we expect the percentages of um, clusters in these different categories, the, cl the uh, cluster characteristics shown in this table to be similar. And you can see if you look down that the percent, there's not that much difference between the percentages. And if you look right down the bottom at the mean number of beds and the median cohort participants um, per home, you will see that those are very similar between the two groups, in spite of the fact that we're randomizing only 78 units. 
So moving on to domain 1B, this new domain covers bias arising from the identification or recruitment of participants into clusters. And we introduced this domain to deal with a very specific sort of bias that arises because of the difference between the way individual participants are selected in cluster randomized trials and what happens in individually randomized trials. So one key issue um, in these trials is that sometimes participants are not recruited at all and that in other cluster randomized trials there may be two or more different groups at which different aspects of the intervention are aimed. So there may be cl clinicians and participants, both of them um, uh, have the intervention aimed at them and we, want, we may want to measure outcomes on both. So because of that, we defined participants um, in cluster randomized trials when you use the tool participants to be uh, those on whom it has been decided that the outcome of interest um, should be measured, whether they're recruited or not and whichever participant group they come from. So the second key issue in relation to selecting individual participants is that um, sometimes participants are recruited into cluster randomized trials after clusters have been randomized. And this can happen, for example, when participants are recruited as a result of an acute event or, or a visit to a health organization. And if it does happen, then it's possible that bias may ensue. So to show how this works, in an individually randomized trial, the recruitment and the randomization all happen for an individual as a sort of seamless process. But once we start thinking about cluster randomized trials, it's slightly different. So in a cluster randomized trial, we recruit the cluster and then we will at some point randomize the cluster. And participants don't get an opportunity to say um, whether they consent to randomization or not. That um, consent is done at the cluster level. They can, however, consent to data collection or to participation in some aspects or all aspects of the trial. One of the issues is that if you do your um, activities in that order, then um, you're quite likely to get bias. And the seminal example of this was the UK BEAM study published in 2005. And in this study, they wanted to improve um, back pain by recruiting um, individuals with back pain from UK general practices. So they randomized practices and some practices uh, were able to offer patients ex extra exercise classes and physiotherapy and a number of other things. What they found was that because patients were recruited um, after the practices had been randomized and those recruiting knew whether they were in the intervention or control group, there are actually more than twice as many individuals recruited in the intervention group than in the control group, because in the intervention group, those recruiting knew that the patients they were recruiting would get the intervention and it was a pretty attractive intervention, they felt. So the other thing about the recruitment in, in the two groups was it, it, the patients were not comparable. In the intervention group, they were suffering from milder, much milder back pain. So in that case, you can see it, it, it just wouldn't be um, a fair comparison to make between those uh, different types of patients recruited in the control in intervention groups. So in order to get around this, the best thing to do is to recruit participants um, before the clusters are randomized. So in between recruiting the clusters and randomizing the clusters. I haven't got time to go through this table in, in detail, but it's in the full documentation. And it just shows six different scenarios of the order in which you do randomization, identification and recruitment. Um, and the three on the left are scenarios in which um, bias is uh, possible. And the first scenario is the one I've just shown you in the UK BEAM pilot. And scenarios two and three, I'll just give you very quickly um, two examples of those. So scenario two, this one example is this trial in, in ICU. And in this trial, although patients were not directly recruited, they were identified by the ICU staff and the ICU staff did know whether they were in the intervention or control group because in the intervention group they had helped to deliver um, the guidelines that were being used. 
there wasn't any evidence of, of bias actually in this trial, but um, uh, there was a possibility of bias. Um, and the, the second example, scenario three, where there was a possibility of bias in the hip fracture trial, um, participants were identified prior to the randomization of the clusters, but actually they were approached about recruitment after randomization. And you can see that exactly the same thing happened in this trial that's happened in the UK BEAM trial. 31% uh, rec uh, recruited of those approached recruited in the intervention group and only 9% in the control group. It seems quite likely that those two groups might not be comparable either because they might have different characteristics. So in domain 1B, we start with this question, important question about whether participants were identified and recruited before randomization. So to go back to the OPERA trial, which I introduced you to earlier, um, in this trial, um, there were 891 patients who were recruited between um, the recruitment and randomization of the clusters. But also in the trial, there were 163 that were recruited after randomization, and they were recruited specifically for uh, an additional um, outcome and analysis at the end of the study, a cross-sectional analysis at the end of the study. So that analysis was a, a secondary analysis, and the primary outcome and analysis was done only on individuals who were recruited prior to randomization. So those individuals were followed up and uh, their depression scores were measured at the end of the study. Um, but outcome two, as I've said, um, the second outcome was um, uh, measured on individuals who, re who were recruited before randomization and also on those who were recruited after randomization. So if we go back to the um, signaling questions for the first outcome, uh, is quite straightforward. All the participants were identified and recruited before the randomization. And so for that outcome, clearly we are low risk. However, for the second outcome, if you, we look more closely at the 163 participants joining the study after randomization, 132 of those were included in the analysis at the end of the study. But if you look carefully, you can see there were far more in the 80 in the intervention home and only 52 in the control home, even though in the study, in the trial overall, more um, homes and more participants were recruited into the control arm. So it does look as if in this case, um, the knowledge of, the, of which home um, individuals were going to be recruited into did actually affect their recruitment when they were recruited after randomization. So in that case, um, were all the participants identified and recruited before randomization for this outcome? Um, no, they weren't. Does the selection of participants look as if it's affected by knowledge of the intervention? Yes, it does. Um, and so for this outcome, uh, according to the tool, we would label it high risk. As a slight caveat to that, you may want to pick this up in the question questions. There was only a small proportion of participants recruited post randomization. Most of them actually were recruited prior to randomization. So going on to um, domain two, bias due to deviations from the intended intervention. And I'm only going to be talking about um, the case when uh, our effect of interest is the effect of assignment. Um, to the intervention, not, not the effects of adhering to the intervention. And we've added just one um, question on the front of this domain. Um, you can see there at the top, are participants aware that they're in a trial? And the reason for adding this question is that it is the case that in some trials, participants are not even aware that they are in a, in a trial, as I mentioned earlier. So this is an example of that. It's the IRIS trial. We randomized general practices. Um, and the intervention was designed to increase the identification of and referral for domestic violence. Um, and a re research ethics committee were quite happy with this, um, that uh, because of risk to the participants and, and other reasons, they were quite happy with the methods that we were using in the study, which involved simply collecting um, outcomes from routine data and patients uh, were not aware that they were part of a research study. Um, so in that case, um, 
we would go from that question straight to the question about whether um, personnel were aware of the intervention. And in the IRIS trial, as in many cluster randomised trials, that definitely was the case. We wanted everybody in the practices, the, the um, GPs, but also other staff to engage with this intervention. So, so they were prompted in, in different ways to, to be aware of the intervention. And so we would say, yes, the person were aware of the intervention. And then you then come down to this question about um, did deviations arise um, that, that were due to the experimental context, which I think is, is maybe um, quite a, a tricky question to ask in some of these, these trials. Um, and I have a feeling that it's quite likely that in many cluster randomized trials, the answer to that would be um, no information and go straight to some concerns. So um, for the OPERA trial, um, researchers collecting follow-up data and the participants themselves were definitely aware of the home um, randomization um, because there were physiotherapists in, in the intervention homes um, providing activities um, and, and various other things going on in the homes. So here from that first question, we would then go down to are the participants aware of the intervention? Are the personnel aware of the intervention? Um, and in OPERA as well as in IRIS, the answer to those questions would be yes. And we would then go into this question 2.3. As for IRIS, um, the questions about uh, are there deviations that arose from the experimental um, context? So moving over to the right right hand part of the um, of this diagram to questions 2.6 and 2.7. Um, question 2.6, appropriate analyses to estimate the effects of, of um, assignment. Um, and I don't want to say very much about this, but what I haven't mentioned so far, and I'm sure there might be a question about this in the questions, is, is step wedge designs. And we designed this tool, um, we started to design um, the uh, the additional considerations to the tool really before step wedge um, trials were um, very high on, on, on people's agenda. They, they've kind of moved up the agenda now. And so um, this tool is largely appropriate for step wedge designs. And I haven't got time to go into those in detail today, though there's more um, information in the full documentation. But just to say, particularly for this question 2.6, there is a, a specific issue that arises in step wedge trials if you don't take account of the secular trend when you're analysing them and that is something that we have um, added as a consideration to question 2.6, um, that appropriate analysis for step wedge designs. However, um, one of the other considerations when you're thinking about analysis um, in these trials is, is how do we define intention to treat analyses and um, so I've, I've just got a slide here showing three different designs for cluster randomized trials. And uh, I mean, I've, I've covered those to some extent already in thinking about the OPERA trial and the fact that we had these two different outcomes, one based on a cohort of individuals um, and the other based on a, a cross-sectional collection of data at the end of the trial. Um, if we've got within our trial uh, just a cohort design, so we're recruiting individuals at baseline and following them up, then intention to treat issues are very uh, are similar to um, individually randomized trials. However, if we've got a cross-sectional design where we are just collecting data at the end of the trial um, and we may not be recruiting people, and that's in fact what happened in the IRIS trial, um, it's, a, it's a quite tricky sometimes to identify the, the traditional idea of intention to treat. It's quite difficult to identify whether individuals um, were, at, were analysed in the clusters that they started off in, because if you just collect data at the end, um, you don't necessarily have that information. Um, but having thought about this, we think that in most cases, it can be assumed that analysing um, individuals in the clusters um, from which their data arose is probably sufficient in most cases. There may be some cases where it's not. And repeated cross-sectional designs are just designs where you might take a cross-section of one um, lot of individuals at the beginning of the trial and a different cross-section of individuals at the end of the trial, and you can probably make similar assumptions as for the cross straightforward cross-sectional designs. 
So opera, as I've said, was a mixture of these cohort and cross-sectional designs. Um, and we followed those principles in opera for the cohort analyses. We included residents in the home from, from which they were recruited. And for cross-sectional analyses, we included residents in the home in which they were resident at the end of the study when their data were collected. So I'm going to go through the rest of the domains fairly quickly because we haven't um, done very much, um, uh, made very much changes to, the, to, to those domains, if at all. So in domain three, all that we've done is to add on this question at the beginning, 3.1a, uh, are um, the outcome data available for all clusters it's just to emphasize really that um, when looking at these trials this particular domain should be considered at both the cluster level and um, the individual level and that includes the principles for assessing missingness um, is is your missingness related to the true outcome and is is the missingness different between the arms and that should be considered at cluster level as well as individual level um, domain four, bias in measurement of the outcome, we have added one um, question which looks a bit odd at first sight. Uh, are the outcome assessors aware that a trial is taking place? And really that's added just for these very specific occasions where you've got trials where the outcome assessors are the patients themselves. There are no researchers involved in the outcome assessment and those patients are not aware that they're in a trial as for example in IRIS. Um, in domain five, a bias in, in selection of the reported results, we've made absolutely no changes at all. So I'm not gonna say very much about that. Um, and this is just a summary of the additional considerations in the different domains. Um, so for the first one, we haven't, ch we haven't changed anything in the domain itself but we need to recognize that the, the assessment may be based on randomizing a small number of clusters. And we need to also consider that some imbalances will arise from the new domain, domain 1B. Um, in uh, the second domain, sorry, my screen is covered with what I've written under my second domain. So you can ask me about that in a moment if you want. I can't see or remember what I wrote. In domain three, we've um, put in that we should consider uh, to missing data for a cluster as well as individual level. In domain four, um, consider whether the outcome assessors were aware that a trial was going on and in domain five, no changes at all. Thank you.